G'day guys and gal, it's no secret that I'm not the biggest Chaos fanboy. I haven't drunk from that Kool-Aid, despite my degenerate personality and my obsession with boobs. I reckon Abaddon is a lame and weak antagonist, and whilst GW occasionally has moments of writing genius, creating interesting Chaos characters and moments here and there, they always manage to ruin it by either killing off said interesting character or turning them into a one-dimensional mustache twirling villain. But I'm not here to talk shit. Well, I mean, that's a lie, I always talk shit, but I'm not here to talk extra shit. I'm here to analyze why my humor is so childish, as well as why the traders lost the Horus Heresy despite having a massive advantage. And before you say, it's obvious Major Kill, the Emperor killed Horus, that's why they lost. No, they had lost before then. Even if Horus killed the Emperor, he was already screwed. He was still dying from the wound Lehman gave him, and a shitload of fresh loyalists were about to arrive and completely massacre the traders. They had lost before they even landed on the throne world. Today we'll go over the who, what, when, how, and why of the traders' defeat during the Horus Heresy. I'm really not kidding when I say the traders had a huge advantage. They genuinely should have won pretty easily, but due to the mother of all fumbles, as well as an extreme lack of discipline, they were able to suffer a pretty crushing defeat feet that continue to keep them mostly sidelined for the next 10,000 years. Let's get into it. Let's first look at the lead up to the Horus Heresy to help determine just how huge of an advantage the traders had. When Horus decided to go traitor and doom the galaxy to an eternity of shit for motives that I think are pretty weak, but that's not what we're here to talk about, he had quite a lot of time to prepare before the loyalists found out. As such, he began to set things up in favor of the traders. For example, as Warmaster, he had authority to order his brothers around and to direct shipments. He sent the best gear, weapons, and ammunition to his own legion, as well as the legions that had pledged themselves to him. He also trained his Astartes in Space Marine vs Space Marine combat, whilst also developing and arming his warriors with special bolter ammunition that was designed for armor penetration. A normal bolter will explode on impact, doing a ton of damage, but not cutting too deep into the armor. However, these penetration rounds were designed for killing Astartes. So for at least the start of the war, the traders' bullets were multiple times more deadly than the loyalists, as well as receiving the lion's share of weapons and gear. This also gave Horus enough time to set up a program within each trader legion to root out and uncover every single potential loyalist. These were the marines who were identified to be more loyal to the emperor than their own primarch. Funnily enough, despite Horus admitting open rebellion to half of the Primarchs when he got them to join his cause, not a single one of them rejected him nor leaked his plans. Hence he was able to get half the Primarchs to sell their souls to the forces of hell without the Imperium even noticing in the slightest. Horus also used his influence to get each of the loyalists to fuck off, sending the lion to deep space to clap some ancient Xenos and Sanguinius to Cygnus Prime where a demonic trap was waiting for him. The idea was to keep all the very problematic loyalist legions separated and in the dark whilst all the traitor legions converged on a single spot. This is why when the Istvan dropsite massacre occurred, nearly every traitor legion was nearby to respond, whilst the loyalists only had three of their weaker legions. Weaker is a harsh term, but if the Imperial Fists, Ultramarines, and Dark Angels were the ones that got ambushed on Istvan, I genuinely think there may have been a different outcome. The point is, Horus had his shit together and moved the pieces directly where they needed to go, but then the first hiccups for the traders began to occur. Ferris rejected Fulgrim's offer to join the traders, which alerted some of the loyalists to the situation. Sanguinius survived Cygnus Prime untainted, and the biggest thing, the loyalist elements of the traitor legions that were sent to be killed in a nuclear firestorm mostly survived intact due to the bravery of a few heroes. As such, the traders had to go in and kill them all manually, which cost a lot of lives, resources, and time. On top of that, the loyalist elements had managed to alert the wider Imperium, hence the time for Horus's deceit and manipulation as Warmaster was over. The Horus Heresy had officially begun. The problematic purging of their legions had weakened the traders a fair bit. First up, around 30% of each traitor legion, other than the really fucked up ones, was loyalist meaning the traitor cause was reduced by around 20% off the bat. Then the effort to purge them cost thousands of traitor lives. Probably around 10-20% to of the Sons of Horus, World Eaters, Empress Children, and Death Guard. So despite the heresy splitting the Imperium in half, giving the traitors and loyalists around an equal amount of weapons, guardsmen, tanks, space marine legions, and titans, the traders were significantly behind in terms of legion sizes and needed to make up the difference. And boy oh boy did they make up that difference. 
When the Imperium discovered the heresy, they sent the Salamanders, Raven Guard, and Iron Hands as a vanguard force to attack the traitors, with the Night Lords, Alpha Legion, Wordbearers, and Iron Warriors backing them up as their reinforcements. Except that didn't fucking happen, as the second wave of reinforcements were actually all secretly traitors. Hence, when the vanguard started to pull back due to suffering massive casualties because of the traitors' armor piercing weaponry, they got fucking cum blasted bukkakied from both ends, as the newly arrived legions opened up on them as well. This reduced the salamanders, iron hands, and ravigan forces by around 95% killed Ferris and resulted in Vulcan's capture. This is when the traitor's advantage was at its largest. They had effectively knocked three loyalist legions out of the game, with the impact of these broken legions being very minimal for the rest of the heresy. To give them an even bigger advantage, Magnus had broken the Emperor's Webway project, hence the Custodes, a force greater than a legion, was busy fighting back a fuck huge horde of demons, while the Emperor was confined to the Golden Throne. To extend their lead even further, the Wordbearers ambushed the Ultramans on Kalth, crippling their fleet and killing thousands of boys in blue. They then summoned a massive warp storm that made it extremely difficult for Loyalists to get back to defend Terra. Then Lorgar and Angron went on a rampage through Ultramar. To give them an even bigger advantage, fuck me the lead never ends, Petarabo tricked the Lion into giving him some super advanced artillery weapons that had a devastating effect on the Loyalists. With the Ultramarines, Blood Angels, and Dark Angels stuck behind the Ruin Storm, the White Scars confused as hell, the Space Wolves weakened after their fight with the Thousand Suns and then getting attacked by the Alpha Legion, then there's the Salamanders, Iron Hands, and Raven Guard whose legions were pretty much destroyed. Not to mention Mars had officially declared for Horus, meaning he was still getting all the good stuff. On top of that, yes it goes further, Demons, an overpowered chaotic sorcery, was now the traitors to command. Shit was looking pretty good for the big bold jihadist, and he decided the best course of action would be to bum rush Terra and end the heresy nice and quick. Here is where the cracks started to show. First off, the Space Wolves had killed most of the Thousand Sons, hence despite the Space Egyptians declaring loyalty to Horus and helping the traitor's cause, they were a tiny legion, and Magnus was just trying to use the heresy to further his own agenda, like the dude nearly became a loyalist again during it. Parts of the Alpha Legion were also loyalist under Omegan's leadership. Omegan didn't agree with Alpharis and the need for the Imperium's fall. As such, this small sect of Alpha Legionnaires did subtle shit to help the Loyalists, such as antagonizing the White Scars, so the White Scars would make their decision and to remain loyal, and return to Terra for the defense. A number of the traitor Primarchs became Demon Princes and lost their marbles. Angron went off on a rampage, and Perturabo had to beat him in a fight and capture him. Fulgrim tried to kill Perturabo and ended up as a Demon Princess Slanesh, aka just wants to wank all day and not actually actually contribute to the uni assignment. Lorgar tried to up Sir Horus as the Chosen of Chaos and was beaten to a pulp and kicked out of the traitor forces because of it. Conrad's sanity was shattered by his visions, which meant that the Lion was able to fuck up the Night Lords really badly, killing a lot of them, capturing their leaders and wounding Conrad. Vulcan had also escaped Conrad and returned to the Loyalists. The Ultramarines and the Dark Angels had also been able to create a temporary gap in the Ruin Storm, allowing the Blood Angels to get to Terra in time for its defense. The delays and fuckarounds with the traitor legions meant that the Loyalists were able to fortify the hell out of Terra, and also update their ammunition and gear to match and even exceed the traders. When the traders arrived on Terra to begin their siege, the Sons of Horus were at about half strength. Horus was mortally wounded after a duel with Lehman, and had to basically just pretend he was okay. Lorgar wasn't present, Fulgrim was fried in the head and got bored of the siege halfway through, preferring to instead torment the civilians. Perturabo was an absolute G and was hard carrying the heresy on his back until he got sick of it and rage quit because no one appreciated him. Angron was running around rampaging whilst his world eaters were suicide charging the galaxy's biggest gun line. Conrad wasn't present and neither was most of the Night Lords. Mortarion was there with his plague marines, acting as the secondary carry for the traitors, but he was taken out by Jagged Eye Khan. Magnus was around, but wasn't really doing much. He even said he didn't give a fuck about the traitors, so not exactly a trump card there. Alpharius was killed by Dawn, which allowed Omegon to withdraw the Alpha Legion. So what was really on Terra was five weakened traitor legions, with only three of those remaining tactical. Of the three tactical ones, Perti left and Mortarion was banished, meaning the dying Horus was the only one who remotely had his shit together, and that isn't saying much. 
Compare that to the Loyalists, who had the Imperial Fist Legion at maximum strength, the White Scars at maximum strength, the Blood Angels at maximum strength, with a decent amount of Custodes and Sisters of Silence. Not to mention they were defending the most fortified thing in the entire galaxy. If the traitors didn't have such a big ass tide of demons, they never would have even gotten close to the palace. With only a handful of legions at low strength, they were doomed by the oncoming horde of Dark Angels, Space Wolves and Ultramarines who were soon to arrive on Terra. Meaning that even if they killed the Emperor and captured the palace, they would have had next to no troops left and the slaughter would have been very one-sided. I mean, even killing the Emperor wouldn't have done enough, as the death of Sanguinius made all the Blood Angels fall to the Black Rage and go Super Saiyan, tearing the traitors apart. By the end, the traitors were actually falling back under the Blood Angels' onslaught, so even without the incoming Loyalists, the traitors were probably screwed anyway. So what could have Horus done differently to win the heresy? Angron and Fulgrim's fall to Demon Prince was inevitable, but he could have used them better. If he captured Angron and then unleashed him on, let's say, the Blood Angels, he could have weakened and delayed them enough so they wouldn't have made it to Terra. Sacrificing the World Eaters to knock out the Blood Angels is a great trade. For Fulgrim, he just needed to uncover his true name to control him. Lorga was able to do this. This brings me to my next big fuck up for Horus. He should have kept Lorga on side, maybe as his number two, so that the guy that actually understands chaos can have an impact. With Lorgar loyal to him, Horus would have had the word bearers at Terra, as well as the Emperor's children staying in line. Keeping Alpharius alive by blocking him from leading the attack on Terra's outer defenses would have done a lot as well. Basically, Horus just needed to be a toxic controlling girlfriend control freak for a bit, and he could have easily won the heresy. Obviously, he couldn't keep the traitors together for long because of their mental degeneration, but he could have done a lot more. Considering the heresy was only like nine years long, he should have been able to keep everyone together, especially after the Great Crusade went for 20 times longer. Once again shows that Chaos is its own greatest enemy, and that anything that can fumble such a huge lead doesn't deserve to be taken seriously. If you enjoyed the video and you want to support the channel, then Patreon is the place to be. Only $1 per month give you access to a boatload of Battle Mace 40 million beautiful art drawings that explore the wonders of the female body. Hit the subscribe button, then hit the real subscribe button for more fumbled content. Join the Discord for more memes, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.